Good afternoon. Here is Henrietta Dupke from Maritime Development Center, welcoming you to today's tidbit where we are going to talk about scrubbers. Uh, the tidbits are taking place every, every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday at 12, ready for enjoying your lunch. Or you can also uh, be working while you are, uh, while you are uh, watching and listening to these tidbits because we can't see you. So if you have any questions, just tap them into the, the chat or down here you have the ask a question um, opportunity. So um, today we have uh, Anna Skipdale in, uh, in the Titbit studio. He is the CEO of uh, PureTech and he has been um, one of the co-founders of the company. It was founded back in 2010. And they are doing all the stuff that pollutes. It can be in the air or at sea. But uh, today we're going to talk about scrubbers. I took up this, uh, this subject because many people have heard about scrubbers, but what is it? And what is, what, uh, what is the benefits of installing a scrubber? Is it the pay back the, the, how to pay back the investment time? Or, and what, is that, uh, what does that mean in order to the low oil price? That is one of the questions that I look very much forward to uh, hear Anders speaking about today. So let's have a toast, Anders. Yeah, toast. <laughs> In the coffee mug. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, to Titbits. Uh, fifteen minutes uh, presentation. Fifteen twenty minutes to presentation. That's the TED Talks concept, and uh, and then we'll have uh, ten fifteen minutes of Q and A. Perfect. Well, hello from uh, Sunbor. Uh, first and foremost, a warm uh, thanks to Maritime Development Center and Henriette for arranging this seminar. Also, of course, thanks to the audience for taking time out of your busy schedule or even while, while you're eating. Um, first, I would like to say a, a few words about PureTech. Would if I could get up the presentation, please? Is the presentation on now, Henrietta? No, it's now. The presentation is on now, Anna. Okay. Thanks, appreciate it. Well, uh, before I begin the, the presentation, uh, maybe I should uh, set the scene. Um, when heavy fuel oil is combusted in a ship's engine, it results in release of exhaust gas into the atmosphere that contains sulfur and particle matters that suit in, in normal language. This results in thousands of premature death due to heart and lung diseases across the globe, as well as a huge amount of uh, acid rain. And this is no longer acceptable. And that's why IMO released back in 2008 a new fuel directive that would regulate the content, on, the content of sulfur in fuel uh, with major reduction in sick area from 2015 and globally from 2020. The uh, fuel directive also allows for, IMO also allows for the use of abatement equipment uh, such as scrubbers, as long as it, it proves that it can clean the, the exhaust to the same level as using compliant fuel. Uh, rest assured that, that these uh, three to 4,000 ships that have already uh, invested in scrubbers have not made a mistake. It does make good sense, and you will learn this during the presentation. It does not only reduce pollution, but also is, a, is beneficial climate-wise. I will try to see if I can go into this one. Okay, uh, the first one, very short about PureTech. We were established back in 2010 to transform environmental issues into sustainable solutions. Very nice words. One of these things were the scrubbers. We are owned by a Danish billionaire, Eric Skabrik, as well as some of the employees. Uh, I'm sitting here in Svendborg in our headquarters. And apart from that, we have offices in, in Tokyo, as well as in Hamburg and actually it's companies. Uh, independent companies. Since 2014, we've been into development of uh, these uh, SOX scrubbers for maritime application. And uh, uh, the first uh, system that we went online was in 2015. And since then we have, we have commissioned uh, and approved more than 100 uh, systems worldwide.
I'm struggling a little bit about changing the the picture here, but I'll see if I can do this. Sorry about that. Okay. I will I'll start the presentation by showing or, or by explaining a little bit about um, uh, how scrubbers actually work. But I'm, maybe you can assist here, Henry. I'm having problems with the presentation. I can't uh, change the picture. Du, 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 du. You can't change it. You don't have it in the full screen? Yes, send, I do. send the presentation right away. Then I will, uh, you just continue speaking and then I will share my screen instead. Does this work no, no. now? It comes now. Okay, it's good. It, it, just took, it just took a while. Maybe the connection is slow. Okay. Yeah. What we do in PureTech is shown here on the, or depicted on this, these, all these pictures. We uh, do everything from, from designing of systems to the final commissioning and approval of the systems uh, during the C trials. We train people in the user scrubbers and so on. We do this globally, meaning that very few systems are, are, of ours anyway are installed in Europe. Major, far the majority is in China and, and uh, Japan. And as, as it says on the bottom of the slides, is uh, scrubbing really the simple solution to a global challenge? Uh, it might not be the only solution, but it's definitely one of the solutions uh, that, that goes up. When we look into what is a scrubber, it's basically a washing machine that, that washes the exhaust gas coming directly from the engine. Practically wise, you basically take out the, the, the silencer from, from the engine, and then you connect uh, a scrubber instead leading all the exhaust gas through the scrubber. First, you cool the gas to make it take up less room, and then you start scrubbing or washing the, 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 the exhaust gas. And we do that in a specific way in our scrubber. So a big, just think about a big washing machine that is washing the, the, the smoke. Um, these scrubbers came comes in, in different uh, types. You can either have open loop scrubbers, which are by far the most in the world, and then you can have a closed loop, which are by far the least in the world, and then you can have some hybrid loops, which can go both open loop and closed loop. If we look into the open loop scrubbers, what, what's happening there is you take in seawater, uh, and then you pump it into the scrubber, using it for cleaning the gas, and then it's being released through drains in the scrubber and directly into the ocean. You measure the exhaust gas on the top of the scrubber to make sure that the exhaust gas is in compliance with legislation. And you also measure PAH, turbidity, and pH value of the water before being released into, back into the sea. And there are some limitations as to what you can release. It's very simple. The seawater simply reacts with the sulfur in the exhaust gas, thus pulling it out, forming salts. The benefits of, of uh, continuing use of HFO, instead of just as many say, use uh, compliant fuel. I mean, fuel that has been designed by refineries throughout the world, where they have made the effort of taking out the sulfur, is that it gives out much less CO2 compared to using compliant fuel. Because, uh, because in not a lot of energy will have to be used to, to, to make new products. When you're talking about HFO, it's actually a residual fuel, meaning that it, that is what is left when you have made all the other stuff like diesel and gasolines and so on. It also uh, reduces sulfur emissions to much less than compliant fuel. And uh, thus there'll be less acid rain and engines will be kept optimized because engines were made for HFO, and there'll be less emission of particle matters. And basically, as we see, it is status quo before and after. I mean, before in time, you left, you, you, the smoke would go into the air, and then you had some rain, and, and all the particles would go back into the ocean. Now, we take it out in a scrubber and keep it out of, of, uh, of people's lungs. If you look at hybrid uh, slash uh, closed loop scrubbers, what you do is now you don't take fresh water in from the sea all the time. Now you just recirculate the water. But that means uh, in a short while there will be no more alkalinity to, to react with the sulfur back in this water. So you have to add an alkali, like it could be caustic soda, 
to, to and, and then make the balance, the chemical balance, you have to bleed out some water. This can either go into sea after being cleaned in, in some water treatment unit, or it could go into holding tanks also after being cleaned and then lift up out, out to land. The alternatives to scrubbers. Um, well, as we see them now, is LNG, LPG, but that's still fossil fuels. And, and there are some ups and downs about using that. I'll come into that later on. Then you could use alternative fuels like uh, biofuels uh, uh, and even ammonia. Uh, ammonia is one of the, the fuels that are, are talked about a lot these days. And, and of course, you can use uh, the ultra low high, uh, high uh, or ultra low fuel oil. Um, either so as a straight one or blended. And then, of course, there are abatement technologies like scrubber. There's hydrogen. You read in the newspaper recently that a big hydrogen factory is going to be manufactured in Copenhagen. And then, of course, we see there's also nuclear, uh, which we see as engineers as the best solution, as, as a, it's the cleanest solution that there is. So I, I think uh, when you look at it, there is no magic bullet. bullet. And it's hard to imagine what kind of technology will bring us in line with the 2050 targets. Most uh, likely, it's not limited to one technology. We don't see scrubbers on something. We see it as intermediate, but, but it's going to be here for a long time. And at present, scrubbers are the most feasible solution pollution-wise as well as climate-wise. If you look at the Synthev study, study, which was made by, it's a, it's a user, Norwegian, uh, and a research company that makes this. If you look at this graph here, I'll not go a lot into it other than, than just claim that uh, the HFO and scrubbers are the lowest uh, environmental impact in regards to uh, release of, um, of uh, CO2. What is a little bit better is if you have high pressure LNG engines, but not many of those in the world. These are studies made from tank to wake. If we look at a business case that's already out there, who's running out there, is, is uh, DFCS was one of the pioneers that started installing scrubbers back in well, many years ago, I think already back in 2008. And now the, the, one of the ships has been operating for more than 10 years. And it's been doing these uh, 50, 56,000 hours of, of uh, ME main engine running. And in the meantime, it's consumed 150,000 tons of fuel. And if it was just to run on compliant fuel, it would by now have released 1,721 tons of, of, uh, of sulfur. Whereas with the scrubbers, it's actually measured all the time. There's continu continuous measurement. They have only released 29 tons of sulfur. So it's actually quite beneficial for the environment. And apart from that, they have saved a lot of money from having to buy more expensive fuel. The benefits of the 2020 compliance and reason for the IMO to take this into consideration are, of course, the health part of it. It means it's pollution. So if you use compliant fuel, you, you have reduced emission of, of, uh, of sulfur into the atmosphere. And thus, you'll have uh, less uh, uh, contribution to lung and, 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 and heart diseases. But if you use gas cleaning systems, you clean out even more sulfur. And uh, that means, and, and, and another benefit is that you, you reduce the soot, I mean the carbon black, into the atmosphere. So, uh, and, and another thing is that you have to measure continuously on the exhaust uh, so that you are sure that you are in compliance with uh, legislation, which made it very hard for ship owners to, to uh, not comply. When we look into the installation experience uh, going on, uh, it's correct what Henrietta said, there's been a lot of talk about scrubbers, uh, but there's also been a lot of scrubbers installed and, and some would even say too many on the yards at least at one time, uh, because they were far behind on the, on the Chinese shipyards leading to a lot of quality issues. So on the right hand side of this slide, I put in some, what I call a teacher's pet scenario. So you have it as a takeaway. Uh, but, but some of the, the installation mistakes that we've seen has been incorrect uh, uh, situation of sensors, piping, 
that does not fit to few supports for piping, cable trays, incorrect installation of, of the monitor, monitoring equipment, and work not carried out in accordance with description and recommendations. That's the mechanical mistakes. In the electrical part, is twisted cables uh, leading to electrical disturbance. It's incorrect use of cable glands and no markings, uh, wrong positioning of cables, and so on. But along the way, we have learned how to how to cope with this, because as an industry, we cannot just lean back and say that the yard has to do better. We as suppliers also have an obligation to assist in rectifying defects and building our products so that they are easier and faster to install. And that leads back to the two slides or the two uh, layer cakes you have on the bottom uh, part of the screen, where you can see that from 2018 to 2019, 20, the cost of installing, total cost of install installing a scrubber system has grown tremendously, mainly due to uh, to uh, much much more expensive shipyards and due to the time that they are due to the, the off hire time, meaning the time that the ship has to be taken out of service to get the systems installed. All of this has happened because there was a shortage of personnel on Chinese shipyards and other shipyards as well around uh, Europe. When you look into service experience, I mean, now we have sailed with these ships for quite a while. Some have sailed for, for since 2015, even before that. But the majority of the fleet has only just been installed. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, we were hit by this uh, COVID thing, uh, which led to a financial crisis and many other nice things. So, uh, we are very happy at PureTech that we early on started on uh, digitalizing our, our products so they are, they are uh, accessible from a distance. The mode access which you see to the left uh, in this uh, slide is is the principle of how we build our systems. It, it's the feature that the ship owner initially had the greatest resistance towards, um, but, but today is something that they value the most. There's no doubt that uh, these uh, COVID uh, travel restrictions have accelerated the shipping industries as a general uh, susceptibility to digital solutions. Um, our system is based on a very safe system so that it cannot be hacked. It's a Sekomea routers and TeamView access. So, um, so it actually works uh, quite nice. Uh, Today, we send uh, engineers uh, across the world, uh, or we, we, we oh, excuse me, we cannot send the engineers across the world, so we have to log on to systems, and we even have performed C trials uh, from a distance. We do the online monitoring to make sure that the systems are in compliance, and, and also we do systems optimization on a distance, reporting, like reporting to flag states uh, or uh, Coast Guard. Uh, operational advice, that means if they have problems on board, we can do that from a distance. We have some spare part management. When sensors need to be replaced, we can do that as well. And of course, we update the software. When we look into the to the uptime of these systems to answer the questions, are scrubbers reliable? Well, we haven't measured on all the ships because we don't have remote access to all our ships. But we have on quite a few ships and, and, and as an average uptime, or compliance level, it's between 98 and 99.8 percent, which is actually quite good. So the the answer to that question: Are scrubber reliable? Yes, they are. And we also have now a pretty good idea what the cost of of operating these systems are. Uh, and we look over a period of 10 years. Smaller vessels is five to seven U.S. dollars per ton of fuel consumed. Medium vessels are like three to four, and larger vessels are just one to to two uh, dollar per ton. Um, so uh, the question from Henrietta was that uh, what, what about the payback times when you see uh, low oil prices as, as you do at the moment? Um, well, the, the answer to that is if you look at it very short term, then economically wise, scrubbers are not feasible at the moment. But if you look at it environmental wise, scrubbers are absolutely f uh, feasible. and. I think that everybody in the business, including the oil companies, now realize 
that things have to go back to normal. I mean, there will be a spread because it's more expensive to produce distillate fuels than it is to produce a byproduct. So we will see an increased span and thus for the guys that have installed scrubbers, they will earn good money by installing these scrubbers. Uh, I think that that's all I had to to say for now. Uh, back to you, Henrik. Thank you so much for for your contribution to uh, to the lunch today, Anders. Um, can you be more precise about how long is the payback time for a scrubber before versus now? Well, if you look at as, as an average before, not not that when it was really hot. When it was, was really hot, you had three hundred dollars in spam. Uh, but, but as an average before, it was somewhere in between one, 150 and 200 US dollars between in span between the heavy fuel oil and the distillate fuel or the compliant fuel, low sulfur fuel and extremely low sulfur fuel. Uh, which means that, that before in time, you had a payback time on some of the rest to feed it big vessels. It was like eight months, 10 months when it was a nice span. But now you are looking at somewhere in between two years and four years. It's depending on how much fuel the, the vessel is actually using. And the ones that use the less fuel, of course, in times where the stand is lower, will not have the scrubbers installed because it's not economically feasible. Okay, so for, for instance, the cruise ships are, are very beneficiary of uh, using scrubbers, cruise ships, because they must be huge fuel consumptors. Oh, but, but uh, indeed they are, uh, because they also use a lot of fuel wire alongside key. I know the port management is working hard to make uh, power available for uh, land power available. But, but for now, they're using a lot of power all the time, basically, also when, when laying uh, at key, uh, taking on passengers and so on, because they run a hotel. So, so in, in their view, it's also more expensive systems, but my guess would be that on most cruise vessels, it will be somewhere, if it's open loop systems, somewhere in between one and one and a half year uh, payback time. And that's kind of low in, in this business. So uh, for, for any installation or for any investment you do in your vessel, as I have heard from people that uh, that's a good payback time when it's only like one, two years, even three. <laughs> But yeah. I think if, if you look at cruise vessels, you know, they are very sensitive to people to public opinion. So so they do not just do it for the benefit of the savings. They also do it because they want to be more environmental friendly uh, to boost their, their image. I have a few questions from our audience. So I will start reading uh, the first question, uh, which is from Sonia Endres. And she's asking uh, in the chat, Aren't open loop scrubbers just converting a pollution from air to the ocean? If measured values in the effluent are not compliant, the effluent would just be diluted with more seawater or some base is added until it meets the requirements. The question is in, in the chat. Okay. Well, uh, to that question, of course, of course, we are now leading pollution into the ocean, but it, it was leading into the, to the ocean anyway. I mean, before in time it went into the air, but then it has to pass through our lungs before it went into the to the sea again with the, with the rain. It came down as acid rain, and all the soot would come down as well. Soot will will basically flow for three weeks or so, and then it will go on land. And first time you have a, a rain shower, then it'll go back into the ocean. So basically, it's the same before and after. But, but the main reason for IMO to implement this legislation are human health and, and of course, to protect the environment. Uh, I mean, animals and trees and so on from acid rain, as well as, as expensive constructions on, on land. Another thing is protecting the ocean. The ocean has a huge buffering capacity and, and they have put in a legislation that says that how much the PAH level must be before it can be let into the sea. And that is taking all this into account. So, I mean, it's no different from a land-based company that has to apply for, for uh, emissions or, or environmental permissions. The same goes for ships. And if it does not fulfill legislation, which is measured all the time continuously, then they are not allowed to use the system. Then they are to, to switch to compliant fuel. 
So they are supposed to have both uh, heavy fuel combined with the scrubber and right. they better also need to have uh, a marine diesel on board because if the scrubber sets up, yeah. uh, you, can, you can switch to the uh, compliant fuel. Yeah. Correct. Good. Correct. Um, Peter Huggins. Also, uh, there's quite a lot of, of uh, harbors that, that prohibits the use of scrubber. So they use ah, uh, compliant yeah. fuel anyhow. So they need to have uh, different uh, tanks in the ships with different fuels. Okay, I got it. Um, Peter Huggett, he's following up on Sonia's uh, question and he asks in the, in the question, um, there is a, still a small pollution of the cooling water that is returned to the ocean or via holding tanks to be dealt with on land, but the pollution is reduced from the level that would otherwise be experienced. Can you answer that question? Well, I think uh, actually, I think it, it's an answer uh, to to uh, to yeah, okay. uh, Lay's question because uh, what he's saying is, if it's a closed loop system, they run it in closed loop. There, there are many oh, closed loop yeah. systems on, on board these uh, cruise vessels. Then basically, they clean the water, and it's only a very small amount that is let back into the sea because you have a huge cleaning plant on board. Then the, the then the, the the residual that you get out of cleaning the water, I mean that that's basically an oil type of oily type of sludge, uh, is uh, disposed and taken care of on land, and that uh, most ports take this and they make sure that it's get treated as it's supposed to be. <laughs> so how many scrubbers are installed worldwide, and how many open loop ports? Who versus closed loop scrubbers do we do we see uh, in the in the portfolio there's not an exact picture of it but but uh, they are, there are some pretty good guesstimates um, yeah. i mean if you look at what's on order and what has been installed it's about 4000 scrubbers a little over 4000 yeah. scrubbers installed now i would say it would be somewhere in between 3200 and, and 3800 scrubbers on, on on board the ships active and i would say that Less of less than ten percent are are closed loop scrubbers. Wow! So but, it's, it's, it's but I mean, in, in our company, all our scrubbers are hybrid ready, meaning that they already have the features. So when the legislation is there, and it will come sooner or later for cleaning the water. I mean, we sell scrubbers for universities like like Flensburg University, and they are testing together with companies different type of water treatment solutions. When they come and they become more cheap and more feasible and more robust, of course, these systems are already ready for it. So you just have to add the water treatment plant and then you're good to go. Okay. So it's not that I'm in disagreement with the lady answering your question. I'm just saying how it is right now. Good. So, but what is the main, what is the world free? Is that six, uh, 60,000 uh, ships? Something like that, yes. Yeah, so it's still like a very, very small percentage of uh, of the world fleet which has scrubbers, actually. Yeah, uh, but you have to. That, that it would be wrong to view it from that point because it's actually the ships that consume the most fuel that had a scrubber. So uh, if you yeah. look look at the total fuel consumption in shipping, which is three hundred and twenty million uh, tons per year, uh, then it's quite a, a nice portion that is now covered by scrubbers. I would say 15 to 20 percent or something like that. I know we have um, a couple of uh, cruise listeners along with us today, yes. so uh, they are also listening attentively to your to your um, to your presentation. So, uh, Peter Hoggett, he's uh, continuing with another question to you. Yes. Also, is there a physical material inside the scrubber that must eventually be disposed of, or is it simply an empty cooling chamber? Very technical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and a very nice answer, a very nice question in my view. Anyway, if you look at a pure tech scrubber, there's absolutely nothing inside. If you look at most <laughs> scrubbers out there, there is a packaging layer. And this packaging layer, which is basically kind of like a distribution layer inside to distribute the, 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 the gas and, and to make sure that the water cleans it well. Um, it has to be replaced ever so often, maybe every two years, maybe every three years. Uh, but in a pure tech scrubber, uh, there's nothing inside, so nothing had to be replaced inside. It's just a hollow pipe. What we do, we do with water, and that is what we have patented. Okay, cool. We also see that Jesper yep. has answer, uh, asked a question yes. uh, about replacing silencers. Yeah, you, you're welcome to read up the, the question and answer yeah. it. 
Okay, if, if replacing silencers with scrubbers on cruise ships, what is the dampering effect compared to the actual silencers? Could it be even better than original? Many for cruise ships, which have a problem with both emissions and sound pollution in port. Uh, that's quite an easy uh, answer to that because uh, using scrubbers, when they are run with, without water, meaning in dry running, using compliant fuel, they basically damper the noise the same way as a silencer. But if you add water, meaning run them as a scrubber, they have a much greater dampering effect on the low frequency noise, meaning the, the, the irritating noise that they hear in harbor, what, what cruise ships are famous for. That will certainly be much approved. And also for old cruise vessels where you have silencers placed near, near the, the passenger areas, passenger cabins, uh, they get a better rest at night for sure. <laughs> Good, cool. Time is running out, Anders, and I think we got uh, pretty much. Oh, Peter, he's just asking a last one. Should we take that one as well? Let's take yes. Peter's. How about That's engine awesome. adjustments um, that might be to? Oh, sorry. How about engine adjustments that might need to be made as a result of a reduced exhaust back pressure? Some back pressure is, of course, necessary. Very technical. I'm not uh, sure. I can I can answer that as well. I'm sure that uh, many can answer that. That's actually a man's uh, man man diesel is a specialist in that, and and a lot of the <laughs> new engines are are made already taking into account that some scrubbers actually create quite a big uh, back pressure. Um, our scrubbers does not, so no adjustment needed to adjust uh, anything when you put in an open tower solution. But if you put in some of the makers on the on the market. It could be it could be necessary to make some adjustments, and I'm sure that Prime Servo Man, which are supplying most of the engines, will be more than happy to to make these adjustments. But for new engines, they are already prepared for it. Cool. And on that note, Anders, we are going to quit the lunch now. And um, I thank I say thank you very much for for joining us today, Anders, and uh, inviting us into into the the world of the scrubbers. Um, I will send out a note to all of you afterwards where we will have the email of Anders and an invitation to, to link in with him. If you have any further questions, he will be more than happy to, to help you with these questions. Um, uh, on that note, I also have to say um, see you next week uh, for the tidbits Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. We will have uh, very interesting topics covered as uh, how to use hashtags on LinkedIn and, and LinkedIn skills in general. Um, we will get to know about the happiness of the seafarers. A uh, huge report has just been delivered from uh, Mr. Stephen in uh, London and he will be, he will be uh, live from there. And we will also have uh, one of the youngsters, only 28 years old, um, Johan, he is the owner of individuals and he will be sharing how to attract and also um, how to engage your millennials in your companies. I think that's also going to be a very, very interesting topic that we, at least at my age, uh, would like to know a little bit more about. Might also be useful for our teenagers uh, to understand them a little better. So on that note, I'm going to ring off here. Because uh, later today at four o'clock, I'm going off for a physical event. We are having our summer business networking, uh, where we are having exactly 50 people attending at the rooftop terrace at Weather News in Tupo Hau. So um, thank you for joining us today at the, this tidbit and see some of you perhaps for later for the event later on. Thank you for, uh, for joining and hope to see you again. Bye bye. Cheers. Cheers.